of the director of the presiding officer then on 19th October 2023. The minister was supposed to bring a statement on 19th, which fell on a weekend. It, they were now supposed to come back on 21st, and they wrote to my office asking for an extension for one week. And today, the minister has informed us that he's ready. And because the minister has given us the document, which has been duly uploaded, can we now listen? Right, honorable speaker and honorable members, this is a response to the issues raised by the leader of the opposition in parliament uh, regarding his statement about alleged human rights abuses and shrinking of civic space. This follows a directive by the speaker to make a response. Introduction. This statement constitutes the response to the issues raised in the statement by the leader of the opposition in parliament typed as Annex A herewith. This statement contained the following. One, that Uganda is among the worst human rights abusers in the world. It also included fresh resubmission of matters regarding the November 2020 riots and attendant deaths and other issues, namely, that the report about those events was never published to 17 and its alleged involvement in indiscriminate shooting of people during the riots. Three, military police vehicle registration number H4DF2382 and its alleged deliberate cause of death to St. Ezra Frank. Four, police vehicle registration number UP4841 and its alleged advertent cause of death. Five, submission of 21 names of people reportedly killed during the riots in November 2020. Six, submission of, this, of the names of 18 persons reportedly missing and resubmission of the same list of reported missing persons contacts through the Speaker of Parliament Vide letter of 19th October 2023. The statement also raised alleged victimization of Muslims and claimed that there are more Muslims in detention or custodial centers than any other denomination. It also contained an, uh, an allegation about widespread detention without trial and claimed that over 500 NOOP supporters arrested in 2020-2021, were detained without trial and released after payment of a ransom from both military and civil custody, and that 50 still remain incarcerated at Kitalia government prison, and last, alleged human rights violations in fishing communities, including claims of rape, defilement, property destruction, murders, and justified arrests and the illegal closure of landing sites. Right Honorable Speaker and members, allow me to respond to each of these as follows. The statement that Uganda is one of the, among the worst human rights abusers in the world is sweeping and unsubstantiated and false. It is and remains government's enduring policy and conviction to respect and protect human rights. In the unlikely event that infraction by individual agents of government, whether in the course of their employment or outside the scope of their employment, or even where private citizens are involved in alleged abuses, the matter can only be addressed in specific terms and not in a casual and generalized way. Relatedly, I would want to comment from the onset and to debunk the misrepresentation in the title of the statement by the Honorable Lop about the generalized claim of gross abuse of human rights and so-called shrinking civic space. 
Right Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, democracies evolve worldwide. Uganda is one of them. We've made tremendous remarkable strides from the individual merit of the movement system of yesteryears, which was all inclusive to the multi-party dispensation that obtains today. The decision to introduce the current political dispensation was conscious and deliberate to allow those who felt uncomfortable under the movement broad-based system to seek the ideological shelter of their comfort for political expression. While the movement system was non-exclusive and served well in the interim to foster national unity post-liberation, the multi-party system allows for people to politically organize distinctively and exclusively around their party ideology. This expanded civic space created by that bold measure of government has enabled the obtaining diversity in the character of our national politics, including the composition of parliament, which is comprised variously by members of the NRM, different political parties, independents, special interest groups, to mention but a few. Quite often, you may hear voices castigating this diversity, this variety, with all its peculiar characteristics. However, such are the compromises of democracy, especially nascent democracies, to, avoid, to afford equal space to everyone to participate in the politics of the country. Some costs notwithstanding. Possibilities and opportunities have therefore been opened for everyone, thanks to the government's big tent approach. In some, the space that allows for the emergence of such diverse participation and expression can be anything but shrinking. Issues to do with the November 2020 riots and attendant loss of lives, injuries, destruction, and related matters. Right Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, this is yet one other additional response on this matter and all others incidental there too. Contrary to what the Honorable Lope claims, an inve investigation was done immediately after the riots and a report to that effect was presented to the last parliament by the then Minister of Internal Affairs. That, in addition to other subsequent numerous responses made about the subject matter, including in this parliament. I needed to make that clarification from the onset to clear the air. That said, and by way of a recap, violent riots broke out and rocked various parts of the country in November 2020 before they were quelled by police and other security agencies. These riots covered Kampala and Wakiso, which were the epicenter of the riots, as well as Mukono, Masaka, Chotera, Rengo, Mpiji, Luero, Oblenzi, Mitiana, Lugazi, Njeru, Jinja, Buenge, Iganga, Namayingo, Namtumba, Luka, Kamuri, Budaka, Busiambale, Arua, and Gulu, respectively. During these riots, extensive loss of property, private and public, and damage to and loss of lives were registered. The destruction of the destruction incidental to the riots, or directly arising from the various riot acts, was immense. This included deliberate acts of arson or torching of buildings and vehicles, use of stones and other objects to hit innocent members of the public, motorists, security personnel and property, physical assault, manhandling and abuse of members of the public as well as law enforcement officers, staging of illegal roadblocks and demanding money with menaces from members of the public also burning of tires to damage and block public roads and throwing petrol bombs into buildings and at security stroke law enforcement officers, among others. During this chaos, even ordinarily sanctified places like court premises were not spared. Wolverine's court premises were set ablaze. 56 people lost their lives including those by gunshot wounds and others whose death were through other causes incidental to the riots. The latter category includes those that lost their lives as a result of uh, accidents, motor vehicle accidents involving 
for example, vehicle registration number UAN H27N, whose driver lost control after being hit by a storm and knocked two people dead, namely Nalwada Kevin and Nsimbe Shafiq. For the six people out of the 56 victims, were male, adult, were male adults and three were male juveniles. 48 of the victims were from Kampala, metropolitan areas also. Uh, this includes Kampala, Wakisa, and Mukono. Two were from Jinja, two were from Luero, one from Rakai, one from Chinoni, Luengo, one from Butambala, and one from PG, respectively. Right Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, security operations are governed by the law to ensure and guide the participating forces on the employment of lethal force. This is ensured through a number of ways, including training, briefing before operations, and debriefing post operations, as well as dissemination of rules of engagement, which have been distilled and reduced into pocketbooks for the tactical operators. The, the SOPs on the use of force booklet is attached as Annex, A, an, annex B to this statement. These are the eight memoirs to assist operators to make informed and rational judgment depending on the circumstances of each case and the prevailing situation, but mindful of the principles of necessity and proportionality in the use of force. These measures, right honorable speaker and members, were in place. The investigations done post the riots Establish the cause of death and injury without conclusive findings about the circumstances of which of the death and injuries, save for uh, LDU or auxiliary number 01700, Mustafa Sali, who was charged and convicted for the killing of Mutasa Ibrahim on 18th November 2020 at Wandegaya Police Station and RA. 172962 Lance Coplum Augustine charged and convicted for the killing of civilian Grace Walungama and fellow LDU Senoga Hussein at Lunguja on 18th November 2020, who were each sentenced to 35 years and life imprisonment respectively and are serving their sentences at Kitalia Prison. The other specific attribution of cause of death is in respect of two diseased, deceased persons, namely Nalwada Kevin and Simbe Shafiq, I referred to them earlier, who were knocked down by the vehicle registration number UAN 827N Toyota Alex, when the driver lost control after being stoned by rioters. There's an attached annex to right honorable speaker and members, which uh, shows the number of people who are arrested and arraigned in the courts of law in the number of 1,088, 949 of whom were charged and 333 convicted for various offenses related to the riots. 14 of these, the total number of the people arrested were charged for terrorism and aggravated robbery and remanded. remanded. 128 were discharged, 474 were released on bail, 60 were bonded, 79 were cleared by the police. Annex J contains the uh, details of these statistics. Right honorable members, uh, government keeps open the window for any fresh and incontrovertible evidence pointing to individual culpa regarding alleged wanton and unjustifiable use of excessive force in order to ensure that the ends of justice and accountability are served. The list of the deceased persons is also here with attached as an extra C. Vehicles mentioned in Lobb's statement. Investigations are not conclusive regarding the alleged involvement of the crew of a vehicle mentioned as UP999 and marked number 17 on its door in the November 2020 riots. The BBC documentary dubbed Free Killings has been established to be the source of this allegation. The registration number of the said motor vehicle is not shown and is under verification. 
where the clip was taken, when and by whom, are not easily ascertainable to enable the requisite verification of the contents of the said clip. The investigations done post the riots, the allegation that military vehicle registration number H4DF 23H2 was advertently responsible for the death of St. Ezra Frank is also not true. Investigations conducted, reference Natete TAR 90 stroke 2020, revealed that the said St. Ezra Frank fell off a speeding vehicle number UBH 856T minibus Toyota Hyas used by the Noob supporters during the incident at Pusega roundabout. Where the deceased who was reported the part of the inner detail of the NUP leader, Robert Chagulani Sentamu, had with others aboard the mentioned minibus vehicle, jumped out and encircled their principal's vehicle, which had slowed down for him to wave to the roadside crowds. When the principal's vehicle sped off, all as, an, as fortunate and fatally fell off after missing a step in his unsuccessful attempt to reboard the said minibus vehicle. The military police vehicle mentioned was following this motorcade from behind when the incident happened, but is not responsible for this fatality. There was media footage that time regarding this incident, which vindicates this narrative. The deceased was rushed to Rubaga Hospital, where he was pronounced dead on arrival. He was hurriedly buried with no post-mortem conducted. The crew of the military vehicle are available so to other ordinary people who witnessed the incident and have all given their credible testimony about the matter. A coroner's probe into the death, had it been allowed to be done, could have rested this matter. Needless to mention that the conduct of the occupants of the above mentioned minibus of jumping on and off a moving vehicle, which resulted in this fatality, was without a doubt in total disregard of caution and in breach of the traffic and road safety laws of the country. The allegation that a police vehicle registration number UP4841 was involved in the deliberate killing of Rita Nabukera and the matter remained uninvestigated is also not true. The driver of that vehicle, constable number 39975 at Tikuru Nasasra, was arrested and the matter subjected to investigations. Following the conclusion of these investigations, the file was forwarded to the RSA. Nakawa for sanctioning of the charge against its suspect in the course of law. The regional state attorney, however, didn't sanction the charges reportedly because the evidence on record was not sufficient to support the charge of causing death through reckless driving, contrary to section 1081 of the Traffic and Road Safety Act. A number of people are injured in the riots and their names are listed in Annex D to the report. These include the widely publicized case of the police female officer whose violent attack by rioters with a hammer was captured on social media. This is ASP Kasule Consolata. Compensation. The government has undertaken to compensate the victims of the riots, deaths and riots who opt to settle out of court, while those who sued government have their cases ongoing and will be handled according to the outcome of the cases. The office of the AG is handling the matter. Missing right honorable speaker, honorable members, the safety and security of persons residing within the territory of Uganda is the responsibility of the government. Disappearance of persons, whether the hands of the state or even by private persons, could inevitably be of concern to government. The Constitution of the Republic of Uganda guarantees the protection of personal liberty and also provides permissible lawful circumstances under which the right to liberty can be interfered with. The manner of arrest, including by members of the public, is well provided for in the law. Once lawfully arrested, a suspect should be held in a legally gazetted place. In addition, our criminal justice system is premised on the presumption of innocence. During arrest, or once arrested, only reasonable, proportionate, justifiable, and lawful application of force is permitted to cause the arrest of a suspect or to restrain him or her in the event that the suspect acts in a manner incompatible with lawful confinement. No one, except a court of competent jurisdiction, through a fair trial process, can determine the guilt of a person 
and the accompanying penalty. This renders actionable anything outside the law regarding the conduct of arrests and management of suspects in custody. This is the law. It has also been reinforced by various SOPs, including guidance from the Commander-in-Chief himself, attached here with as Annex E. That said, right on the speaker, honorable members, the Uganda Police Force did conduct investigations into the matter of the alleged missing persons. The police, however, was confronted with a number of challenges and constraints which do compromise the integrity of the findings from the people given by the Honorable Lop as next of kin. The next of kin of the reported missing persons, first of all, didn't cooperate with the police investigators until the police team had to hold out as members of an NGO in order to interview these people. For example, Nabakoza Florence, the next of kin of Wangoro Dennis, Alias Shafiq, declined to meet the investigators, stating that she had not got instructions from NUP to meet any person. Nanyonjo Oliver, the reported next of kin to Ruemba Mustafa, made further reference to one Mosisi, who became hostile when the team requested to meet him. Later, there emerged trending videos and audios from the Honorable a lead of opposition that the police team wanted to meet this kin, next of kin at night, which wasn't true. The next of kin preferred dealing with NGOs as opposed to the official investigative agency of government, the police, which makes the work to find the truth about the matter extremely difficult. People who are allegedly arrested with some of the reported missing persons also refuse to make statements. For example, Musa Sali, Kasasa Amim, Muwaire, and Semba Hakim, who allegedly arrested with Semodum Michael Jackson, declined to provide information to the police. Most of the alleged disappearances were never reported to the police. For example, the alleged disappearance of Damlira John, Chiria Peter, Wangolo Dennis, Sesaz Isma, Mubiru Hassan, Baguma Joseph, Alaya Semoju Joseph, and Zimula Dennis, Alas Boy, were all never reported to the police. Right Honorable Speaker and members, it is the law and official practice that for one to be declared a missing person, a missing person's report must be filed. This can only be with the police, which wasn't done and which is still being resisted by the people approached. Here said testimony by the next of kin and witnesses. Most of the next of kin aren't eyewitnesses to their late disappearances. They were recounting to the investigators, come and NGO, the stories of the arrests as told by unidentified and unascertainable third parties and third sources, which renders these secondary testimonies unreliable and less corroborated. Fictitious people. Investigations reveal that there exists no Semuju Joseph, as listed in Lopes tabulated matrix serial number 10. The contacted next of kin insisted that the alleged Semuju Joseph is actually Baguma Joseph, serial number 17 whose alleged disappearance was never reported. Searches were carried out in different government data banks to wit Interpol, Forensics, NIRA, City Mochari, Kampala, and Immigration. In NIRA records, information of nine people out of the 18 wasn't available. The data profile lack thereof from the various agencies for the given names is contained in Annex F, and I will refer to each of the names later. Some cases, where the lead of opposition attributed an alleged disappearance to security had been reported earlier by the relatives of these people as unwitnessed disappearances. And these include Kasumba George, uh, Kisembo Godfrey, and Kipalama John Bosco. Occurrences being reported to have taken in broad daylight. None of the alleged witnesses mentioned the registration number plates of the alleged vehicles involved. It has also been established that there is a well-orchestrated smear campaign of aiding people who seek to go abroad in search of livelihood opportunities to claim political persecution and or persecution for belonging to sexual minorities. These false and mendacious claims against government are unfortunately sometimes believed by those in the host countries who are gullible to take these claims as true without verification. Others still sometimes are fugitive fugitives from justice. For example, the suspects who had evaded appearing in court for assaulting a one come to Ivan, 
Alias Majambere were aided to leave the country. These are Unzima Godfrey, Alias Tower, and Shikomeko, Alias Yekorera, Alias Sitongwa, who assaulted Majambere and were due for prosecution when they fled. Onzima eventually returned and was charged but granted bail. Inconsistencies in the numbers and testimonies in the various claims of reported disappeared persons presented variously to the Human Rights Commission, the Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights, and the latest statement by the opposition, respectively. The respective reports are hereby attached as Annex G1, G2, G3, respectively, for references regarding the inconsistencies. In a nutshell, lack of cooperation and the refusal to report, coupled with the other concerns raised in this response, make it extremely difficult to come to the bottom of the matter of alleged disappeared. Muslims and claim that there are more Muslims in detention than the other denominations. Uganda is a secular country. The right to freedom of worship is guaranteed by the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda. The government is and has always been committed to respecting the rights of all people irrespective of their faith. Participation in crime in all its manifestations is an individual choice. Any attempt, therefore, to seek shelter in ethnicity, religion, gender, or political affiliation in order to evade criminal liability is grossly misleading and untenable. In the unlikely event that there are wrongs committed by law enforcement or security agencies in the course of their work, including the conduct of arrests, these should be addressed according to the specific circumstances of each particular case, but not on the basis of the identity of the suspect. It would be wrong and unlawful for law enforcement to mistreat a Muslim by applying methods that are in controversial of the law, as it would any other person of a different faith, or even those that don't subscribe to any religion at all, for that matter. Because the sanctity of human life and attendant rights are common to all, irrespective of identity or social standing, and should be respected and protected as such. The statistics from the Uganda Prison Service as of 30th September 2023, indicates that Muslims constitute only 16.4% of the inmates of all Uganda, in all Uganda's prisons. They fall far behind Catholics, who are 43.1%, and Protestants, who are 29.5%, respectively. It is therefore clearly not true that the number of Muslims in prisons is bigger than that of the other denominations, even in relative terms, in terms of population ratio. It is also equally not true, because of these statistics, that the Catholics and Protestants are targeted on account of their faith. The detailed statistics from the Uganda Prison Service are attached as Annex H1, H2, H3, and H4 for reference. Pre-trial detention. The government strives to ensure that only persons charged before competent courts of law are held in prisons, and every suspect has a commitment warrant. Indeed, government is duty-bound to ensure that the persons in custody are lawfully arrested, duly charged, and lawfully remanded in prison. The fate, therefore, after all this due process, lies with the courts of law once they are charged. However, it may be the case sometimes, due to the nature of investigations of some cases, for suspects to be held beyond 48 hours before they are charged. Government is working around the... Uh, clock, uh, governments are work, working around the clock to ensure that these issues are sorted and due process is followed, including the possibility of legal reforms as well as other pragmatic administrative measures to improve our criminal justice system. And I'm glad as I came here, one such measure was being handled by Parliament. Government acknowledges that in the recent past, the judicial system was bedeviled with pretrial detention, also partly owing to the limited number of judicial officers and prosecutors. Government has addressed and continues to address this matter through the recruitment of more judicial officers, prosecutors, and state attorneys, and the increase of high court circuits, court of appeal circuits, and the magistrates' courts. Indeed, the independence of the judiciary has also been enhanced by the enactment of the administration of the Judiciary Act 2020. It is expected that these interventions will bolster the efficient dispose of cases and thereby drastically address the issue of pretrial detention. In any case, there are also remedies 
other than suing government, which anyone can invoke within the law presently for those cases of detention beyond the prescribed period before trial. These include the right to invoke the writ of habeas corpus, among others. Alleged human rights violations in fishing communities. Prior to government's strategic decision to deport us of Uganda, the fishing industry was on the brink of collapse and fish processing industries had begun to close. This was attributed to the indiscriminate and unregulated fishing by the fishing community. There has been tremendous improvement in the fishing industry thanks to this intervention by the president of setting up the UPDF task force to deal with irregular fishing. In the course of its work, however, complaints of misconduct by personnel of this unit have sometimes been registered. The UPDF has a code of conduct which, since its inception as NRA, has been integral to the law governing the UPDF. That is the UPDF Act and the NRA Statute before it. The UPDF arose out of popular frustration against misrule, including repressive behavior against the population by members of the armed forces. No wonder in the constitution of Uganda, the befitting name of choice for the force was UPDF, emphasizing the founding character of the UPDF as a people's force. I want to assure the House that this remains the case, and whoever deviates within the ranks is dealt with according to the law. What I know and is public. Illegal fishing gear, as well as the immature fish, once impounded, are usually publicly disposed of. I wish therefore to report that many of these complaints have been dealt with and the culprits punished. The details of the information about the cases registered and action taken is available with the MOD, uh, Minister of Defense and Veteran Affairs. All prisoners in Uganda is a democratic country under the multi-party dispensation, the rights to freedom of association and expression are guaranteed under the 1995 Constitution of the Republic of Uganda. It's not a crime to belong to a political party and to lawfully carry out and participate in the activities of political parties. Premised on the above, the government of Uganda doesn't arrest people because of their political inclination. People are arrested and charged for suspicion of commission of crimes that are clearly prescribed under the law. The people reportedly held in custody were charged with various offenses and the courts will determine their cases. If there are complaints about the conduct of these cases, there are remedies within the law which can be invoked by the complainants. Agencies and institutions of government are not above the law. The general court marshal's jurisdiction, which is being challenged in law statement, is a lawful court and has jurisdiction over the trial of civilians where such civilians are charged with offenses of the nature that brings them under the ambit of the jurisdiction of this court. This is the position of the law until the matter of the court's jurisdiction is settled by the Supreme Court, where an appeal about the court's jurisdiction presently lies. The details of the persons under trial are the GCM in Annex I for reference. In conclusion, right honorable speaker and members, the government of Uganda is committed to the respect, observance, promotion and protection of human rights of all its citizens. It's one of its core values and beliefs. Government has its roots in resistance against misrule characterized by gross violations of human rights. There are for wrongs within its ranks. In the unlikely event that they happen cannot be systemic, they can only be individual mistakes, which should certainly also be dealt with. It's government's consistent commitment to expose and punish mischief within its ranks, even when sometimes it may take time to do so for a number of unintended reasons and circumstances. Government believes in accountability, believes in the rule of law and compliance with due process. Incidentally, there's no limit, limitation period in our laws as far as criminal liability is concerned. Any fresh and credible information is welcome, provided it is reported officially to the appropriate authorities in order to aid the conduct of formal investigations. The response, right honorable speaker and members, suffices to illustrate that compliance with due process is not mere sloganeering of formality. It is government's founding and enduring philosophy. Last, I would want to remind our colleagues in the opposition that democracy is not just about the exercise of right. It's, all about, it's also about observance of the duties and obligations that accompany those rights. It's about the exercise of civility and leadership, even in instances where we may have divergent perspectives on how to build 
grow and consolidate our democracy. Towards this end, government has always been willing to constructively engage on these and other pertinent matters. Hopefully, our colleagues are also willing to recipro reciprocate and stand tall above prejudice and politicking to use the available abundant civic space for the advancement of our common good. Right Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, this is our considered response. I beg to submit, Right Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members. Right Honorable Speaker, I would like to appreciate the the Honourable Minister of State for Internal Affairs for reading out a statement signed off by his senior who never attends uh, to House Plenary since he was vetted in a committee in which I was a part. Let me speaker. Leon Trestroy was a philosopher, political philosopher from uh, the 19th century, and had this to say, if you feel pain, you are alive. If you feel other people's pain, you are a human being. Uh, let each of us place ourselves in any of those spaces whether we are both or one of those. Right on the speaker. Right on the speaker, the power of the people is resident in this House of Parliament. And the power to sustain it is domiciled in Parliament. And therefore, nobody can repurpose the power of Parliament to sustain, maintain, and assure the power of the people. I have, I received this, graciously received this document around 11 o'clock from the minister, and I appreciate. It's um, a 17-page document, authored over a period of 40 days, if you divide uh, 40 by 17, it can speak to the number of paragraphs authored on each day. We appreciate the attempt to respond to this. Right on the speaker, it should never take anybody with any power 40 days to respond to the needs of the people especially when it's rates to rights, right on the speaker. And it's 40 days plus two and a half years, right on the speaker. Right on the speaker, now that we have received this, I would like to ask of your indulgence to allow me and my team to make a rejoinder to this statement. And... Uh, this rejoinder will place each one of us in the philosophy of Leon, whether we are actually alive or indeed we are humans. Mr. Speaker, I will not take, I don't need 40 days. I will be back on Tuesday to make a rejoinder, Mr. Speaker. And in that rejoinder, I will make very particularized prayers for which this House of Parliament will be on test. I'm glad I'm here, right, Mr. Speaker, that I have learned new phrases and new words such as unwitnessed disappearance. When the Honorable was can, mentoring. Can we, can we first handle on your prayer? Right, Honourable Speaker, I, I so pray that the prayer is, um, uh, finds your consideration, that we make a rejoinder, so that we can make good sense out of this 17-page uh, document authored across 40 days. So, I give it to pray. Thank you. Oh. Honourable members, 
the report came a little late, and we expect a rejoinder from the opposition. And it's just prudent enough that uh, we give the leader of opposition to bring his rejoinder on Tuesday at 2, and then uh, we'll have this report. We'll take a decision on that day on what will we do. I now adjourn the house to 2 tomorrow.